Hello. Hi, is this Mitzi? Yes. Hi. Hi. It is. Let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. She is an actress and a director, and we're going to be talking all about her new documentary, The Process. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Mitzi Capture to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hi, guys. (laughs) Wow. Love talking to you. Uh, Big fan. I must say our, our show usually covers a certain genre of TV and film. And, and for our audience, you're actually quite young. I mean, you usually cover <laughs> somebody 70 and over, but you're... You're you're a baby. You're just a baby to the call radio audience here. You already got me. That's all. <laughs> That's all. That's so sweet. Wow. <laughs> I feel so much better. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, am I right in reading in my notes that you actually had twins? But I, I thought about having twins. It just never happened. Oh, okay. Well, That's sometimes these sometimes these notes are wrong. I know I'd read on Facebook yeah. that you have a uh, college age daughter, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I have two daughters in college. Wow! Wow! wow. So uh, pretty let's, cool. We're pretty cool. Let's start off by talking about. Obviously, we're going to talk about your acting career and and things like silk stockings. But I wanted to start out by talking about. Uh, your documentary uh, for people that don't know tell us a little bit about the process what is it and and what can people be in store for if they sit down to watch it well um, this particular one I mean the it's really sort of the first out of the gate if I choose to continue to do them but um, it's part of a bigger concept that I had um, and really sort of how the process is being lost to modern technology and all those good things and I won't go into the whole backstory to it but really the first sort of inkling of a thought about it came up when I was on um, silk stockings actually and just I always loved you know being one with the crew I mean just like feeding off that energy Mm -hmm. of like everyone there with you and um, and I just loved how it took the whole machine to make a moment happen you know, it, <laughs> like if something worked, it wasn't just me. It was like 120 other people and the right. director, you know. So with that in mind, I actually had lunch with Stephen Cannell one day, and, and I just sort of casually mentioned it to him, and he goes, I think that'd be really interesting to show that. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's really part of a much bigger concept. And so I just, you know, pondered on that and did other projects and sort of sat in the back of my mind. And, and then... Um, you know, so I thought, well, the first one out of the gate, I should just start with one instead of trying to chomp off the whole franchise idea. And uh, and I thought, who's, like, really good at what they do? Mm-hmm. Whose process can I show mm-hmm. that, you know, and, I, and it just seems so appropriate. Uh, I knew Larry Moss. He's, like, the dude you go to for acting coaching. <clears throat> I mean, he coaches Leonardo DiCaprio, Hilary Swank, and... I had worked with them before he really started exploding um, and continued to work with them off and on for coaching. But um, I just thought, you know, he, he has such a nurturing and beautiful um, relationship with his actors. And um, so I approached him and said, how would you, would you like to be involved with this? And, you know, we can show your process. And, and so it sort of evolved from there. And, um, and so I actually was getting cameras donated to me from Panasonic, and wow. I shot hundreds, hundreds of hours from, you know, him in his acting class with actors. But then, you know, we put it together, and we were like, you know, this really doesn't show the whole process, yeah. and we, that was the big key thing for me. So <clears throat> then he asked me, he was like, do you want to film this play I'm doing? And I was like, well, when does it go up? And he was like, next week. And I was like, no, because that's not the process. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so about two weeks later, he called me. He goes, hey, James L. Brooks just asked me if I would um, come to USC and work with young directors on how to work with actors. And I was like, yes, right. that's it. So, um, so, yeah, I just went in and I thought I can't do this like I did before because it was a huge auditorium. And there were no marks on the ground. There were no... It, like rehearsal anything so I just placed four cameras um, plugged into their sound system and 
I just sat over in a dark corner with a monitor and a headset and directed the cameras from a corner, mm. just trying to anticipate what their instincts would be, right. where they were going, and how to tell the cameras, like, push in, you know, go over here, pan over here, do this, do that, pull back. And it was so exciting. It was just a blast. Um, and to me, that was much like I was in the process with them, which was so much more exciting of a discovery. Mm -hmm. And I think it gave the film that idea that as the audience, you're in it. So, and we had one camera like back slightly over the heads of the audience so you could be actually sitting in the audience to kind of put you in that space. Um, and so it was really a look and James L. Brooks was there. And for people that may, younger people that may not know him, I mean, he's a, like a three-time Academy Award winning right. writer, producer, director, and in terms of endearment, like these guys like know what they're doing. You Absolutely. Know? So it, was, it was just such a great experience. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, I sort of edited as I shot. And then it was the process of editing, which is a whole other thing to give it the voice that you want. Right. Um, but I know, you know, for me, the main thing was, and I think it was with most of the jobs that I've acted in as well, um, when I direct, I like to, as much as I can, and if it still serves the piece, to, like, elevate the message. Like, I just think as a society, we get so much negative input, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I didn't want to put anything out that, like, made anyone feel bad or inferior. It's like, no, this is what we do. This is how hard we work, and it can be really fun. That's sort of the message we agreed on. Well, you know, something, like, something that's interesting is I wanted to ask, I mean, was there any certain steps that you took with shooting or with editing because when you are doing something in person, um, rehearsing, filming, on stage, there's a very different feeling, a very different connection between the actors, the director, and even the audience if they're doing stage than a lot of times comes through on something that is filmed. Right, right. So I think it was much more truthful. You know, there was no special lighting. I mean, I think there was one extra light put in there. It was very honest. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course, we did color grading after just to, to make the colors balance, but they look like they look, you know, and so it's not, you know, like an Instagram post right. or, or like a really high end film where people look, you know, just like, you know, like a dream right. almost, you right. know, so I, you know, I hope that's beneficial to actors that they can see that you can be vulnerable while you're playing to find the moment and not be afraid of that. Yeah. I think your documentary plays well to not only actors coming up into the business, but also audience people, because I, before that, didn't really realize how important an acting coach was. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, well, an actor, they can just read their lines of why they need a coach, but an acting coach is really very important, and I think you showed that. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of people, I mean, like, for instance, when Larry coached Hillary Swank in Million Dollar Baby, he coached her, I mean, I just talked to an actor about, because I'm doing a little bit of mentoring right now uh, with COVID and everything, um, an actor called me and said, oh my God, they want me to have an English accent, I'm just freaking out, and I just said, you know, <laughs> you, like, even in The Jewel with Hillary Swank, they not only had Larry Moss there, they had a dialect coach that worked there before the film, and then, you know, don't try to jump through the process, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know. They don't expect, unless they want to hire a person that just innately has an English accent, they're not going to, they know they can work with that, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, it's like being willing to go to the steps and, and, um, and, the, and enjoying the journey, you know, not being afraid of it. I want to know what what is it that motivated you now here you're you're a lovely woman and and you still are a lovely woman you. and, and you was in one of the biggest detective shows uh on television was on for eight years and you were doing movies and everything and then you got this bug i know you started directing on silk stockings and you got this bug to be behind the camera you would think a woman that has a personality and a charm and the looks and everything 
and and the career that you've had that you would just be more into to acting because you certainly got a lot left in you. Oh well, thank you. Um, you know, I it's really interesting. I like that that moment when I was filming the final process that ended up on film. I have never felt more in my zone, and um, I think it's a combination of as an actor, you do feel like a lot of it's based on, you know, they put on the certain outfits or certain scenes and to, to you know, give the message of a certain thing that's happening or you're going to look more tough here, you're going to look more sexy here, or whatever it is. So you're told, like, what to wear, what to say, where to stand, <laughs> <laughs> all those things, right? And so when I directed, suddenly it was like, and I've said this before, so I hope it doesn't sound cliche, but um, it, it's like going from being a color of paint to add to the the whole thing to like having a palette of paint mm. that you can help configure the picture. Right. You know, you just have so many between the lighting and the and just the excitement of working with the crew. I, I love crew. I, I've been really blessed with like really great crews that like really cheer you on you can feel them holding their breath when something gets emotional and they just come up and hug you after <laughs> it's, just, it's so it's like having this humongous family that's there to see you go through your emotional journey you know but i just yeah i just i love all of it really i've got a feeling but that, i just uh, i felt freer directing right, right. i've got a feeling that, that Stephen cannell was very supportive in, in you getting the bug too because I know of some other women that are friends of mine that wound up working with him and, and they were just a secretary. He encouraged them to actually write episodes with him of some of his shows. He seemed to be very supportive. Was it really kind of him that pushed you that way? or? Um, you know, I think I would say I've had really good luck as a whole um, with supportive and uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but I would say I've worked with mostly men directors. I think we had one female director on Silk, and I know that's all changing. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes, Stephen was one of the strongest pillars, I would say, that just believed in me, and um, he, you know, he, he took notes, executive producer David Peckinpah, like in the beginning, if I said, this doesn't feel right, they sure were like, you know, just an actress she can't learn or whatever <laughs> but then you know they started listening and i would say i can't i don't know why but like all the other dialogue i can digest but this one scene just doesn't seem organic for my character and i i started learning that if i couldn't memorize certain lines which wasn't often um it, it just meant it wasn't organic to her because i was playing her 16 hours a day yeah you know most of the time so they would say, well, like, what do you think she would say? Or how, and they would rewrite the scene. And I, that's just so empowering as an actor to, like, you know, become, um, what's the word? It's like to become you, oh, gosh, I can't think of the word. But it's like you work together. It's not like, oh, he was the executive producer. So I'm just an actor. They, they want your voice. And I think they like that when an actor steps in, you know, and says, this doesn't feel right, without being a pain right. about it, you know. Um, and so I, I, that was really great, and I look back now, and it's, you know, the fact that back then, Stephen Cannell had the foresight to um, treat us as Rob and I, um, as my co-star, as complete equals. Right. And um, that was a really empowering way to really step into uh, the business as well. I mean, they even went so far as to give uh, me first billing on one episode, and the next episode they gave him first billing. Wow, and I've nice. never seen that done. Oh. Since wow. I mean, I, I don't, I, you know, I haven't seen everything, but I just, I thought that was so innovative, you know. Well, and, I guess uh, it just set a tone. Right. It's definitely an actor's dream to be able to uh, get as well known as you did for something that has that that much drama. To where you really can show how well you could act, but I heard you say in an interview you had reservations about getting into silk stockings because it, it involved a lot of death and and you know murders and this and that, and it was done with a sexy edge, that's for sure. But how do you feel about getting into that druid kind of storyline? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it was pretty dark, and I got to say, because usually two days a week, sometimes three on a big, heavy episode where we're solving a crime, we would be in this dark stage and usually work till the wee hours of the morning because they didn't shut down the stage. Um, but even the crew would say, yeah, you know what happens when you're in a dark hole for two, 48 hours, you know, you start mm. to feel dark. And um, so what I just, I, you know, I didn't, I don't even think I talked to Larry about that, but I, because um, there was a lot of things I talked to him about that. Um, he coached me. Well, actually, I studied with Larry for about a month before. I, I was just getting ready to leave the entertainment industry. And um, I, I found a place that I wanted to move to out of state and all this stuff. And then I had um, reached out to Larry before and he didn't have any openings in his class. And then he calls me like right when I decided to leave. And he was like, hey, you want to, I think I've got a spot for you. Mm. You want to come in? next week and so that began this beautiful journey for about a month and then I booked Phil Socket mm. and I actually called him crying you know I was like <laughs> I so wanted to study with you I just I, I don't think I, I want to do this I want to like really get you know immersed in this and everything and, and he was like honey like that's why you work with me so you can get work that's you right. got the job <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> nobody realized it was going to go five years, you know. And, you know, and also I didn't even think, of, I, you know, I would call him for other movies I did and stuff. And he would, you know, I'd go see him and coach with him. But, um, yeah, pretty interesting. It, it was so, ahead of his time in the fact that things are going that way now. And that was one of the first ones that started out on CBS and a big network and wound up going to the USA Network. Uh, the cable thing, because now everything's going to a cable network or to Netflix or whatever. You guys did that, like, one of the first ones. Well, you know, it was really interesting. Um, they told me that it was going to be on two no networks, CBS and USA. And I was like, okay, well, that's a cool point, because yeah. it's, you're doing one job and getting double the exposure, the reach. Um, and it was really smart of them, because what they did was with the budget. So it cost two networks half the money to get a show. Mm -hmm. And that was great the first year. And then uh, and then CBS, uh, suddenly they decided to get rid of those shows um, at that hour. And uh, they brought in David Letterman in our time slot. So <laughs> I always wish I could go on David Letterman when he was still on and go, like, you stole my time slot. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> How could you? Um, but yeah, no, it, it, and it worked out fine. You know, our our viewers followed us, and um, you know, it had a strong following. And even to this day, it's wild. People, like, I'm out in the middle of nowhere where I am right now, and you know, with masks on, and the whole thing with COVID, and you pull up at this country gas station where they still pump your gas and everything. This dude goes like, "Is he?" <laughs> Are you, you were on some socket and, and all this stuff and I was like oh like you know I feel so embarrassed How well, much it was kind, of, it, head, it was kind of interesting though because uh, correct me if I'm wrong but because Silk Stockings was on USA which was syndicated all over the world I mean you guys not only got exposure in the US and, and Canada and things like that but even in a lot of you know other countries you guys were well known yeah yeah, and you know, and I have to also give that to another one of the producers, David Peckinpah. They were just smart guys. I think ahead of their time, honestly. Um, you know, it's um, you know, it's, it's, it was it was pretty cool. But you know, I, I just wanted to comment one thing back to what you said about um, about the dark and all that stuff. Is uh, you know, Stephen Cannell had my character narrating the episode yes mm -hmm. and um like a few episodes in i was like i i just how can i work in this like these dark storylines and stuff and suddenly i went oh my character's not in the dark she's fighting for the good and to help people right and once i found that and hooked into that it gave me so much more power it's like you know it's first of all it's 
so much fun to play a cop and pull a gun and say free. <laughs> I mean, it's like playing cops and robbers. All, we would laugh so so many times when we'd have to do that. They'd have to cut. Or just you know, we'd be really tired and have to go free. You know, <laughs> like, but um, but it was so much fun. And and once I started realizing that you know I was standing up to the bad guys, which is like a life dream for right. any person you know and the terminology like, too we we revisited the first episode and i never knew what silk stockings meant i thought it was just a catchy title but it's a certain type of crime a certain case that you and rob did do you remember what yeah. that was um well yes it was um crimes of passion yeah mm-hmm. high profile crimes of passion so typically you know it, every episode would start with something sexy and like this couple being involved and typically a senator or someone like that and then some young girl who was having an affair or whatever it was um, someone was stealing something to get something and um, the crime would always happen during that scene and um, uh, so yes hence why they called it silk stockings and um, yeah they also made all these references to being a golfer, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, and so then came this talking about slamming Sammy Sneed, who's like one of the greatest golfers, and so then we ended up nicknaming each other Sammy Sam, <laughs> and you know that got kind of out of hand for a while. Rob and I started improving all the time. <laughs> hey Sam, you know, and then one of the David Peckinpah called me one time, and he goes, "Okay." We got to cut back on the Sam. <laughs> you guys called each other Sam thirty-five times in the last episode. The, the whole terminology so. is like, "Well, did you go to the uh, opening? What's the opening? It's an autopsy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a big event. No, but it, it was um, uh, it was kind of you know cutting edge for the day because you know I I love Rob Estes. I think he did great. Mm-hmm. You guys had good yeah. chemistry together. But really, if you look back at the show, between you narrating it and between some of the things that your character did as a female cop, even butting heads with the DA, it really was empowering to women. You weren't just, you weren't set dressing. You were kind of leading the show. I love that. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because I used to, and I hope this doesn't sound pompous, but like, you know, when you work 16 hour days, like any essential worker right now, I'm sure gets it, but it's like, you know, you find different things to keep you going. And I can't do caffeine that much when I'm working, mm-hmm. but it makes me too jittery and I, I can't get in touch with my emotions. So, um, so I started like playing different games in my head, just different tricks, like, you know, Ron Howard's in the next room. I've got to get my energy up for this scene because he's watching it on the monitor. <laughs> and he, you know, whatever it took. I had so many different tricks, and I would just go in and do that. And it would give me energy. But there was one point, you know, probably in the second season or something, that I just was like, oh, my God, how am I going to get my energy up for this scene at, like, 1 o'clock in the morning? And, you know... The, the hardest scene of the episode, like, you know, in the 15th hour or something. And I went to my my room, and uh, in between there was light, setting the lights and everything. And I typically never read, um, I hate to say this, but I didn't read fan mail. Um, either my agent or sometimes my dad would for me, <laughs> whatever. So um, just because I didn't have time and I didn't want to miss anything. Right. And um, and so one day I went to my trailer and there was a package of mail of letters and I was like, oh, that's weird. They don't usually come here. And I thought, I'm just going to open a couple of them real quick. And one was like, you know, you've extended my dad's life. He's in a nursing home. Mm-hmm. He looks forward to your show every week. And I almost got tears in my eyes. I was like, oh my God, like I'm really responsible for something here. <laughs> and then this young girl wrote me and she was like she said I'm I'm grown now but when I was 12 I was going to run away from home and I saw your episode where you took in this runaway and taught her about morals and all this stuff and she's like so I didn't run away and I'm doing this in my life now and thank you and I was like okay 
I can go out and do the next thing. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right. It, it just, I felt really, um, really responsible for the message that I was carrying, knowing that it did impact some people. And you even know, if you affect a, just a couple people or help a couple people, yeah. you know. And you know, even before that, too, if I can mention, and I, I thought you were very good because we saw it last night, uh, before Silk Stockings and, and talk about working with, with, you know, pioneer filmmakers and now you're into filmmaking and you know how hard it is. The, the, the godfather of Pioneer Filmmaking, the Roger Corman Company, you did Angel 3, and in that, you were somebody that was on the streets and wound up helping people, and you were, like, busting a, a white slavery ring. I mean, that's kind of, it kind of reminded me of Silk Stockings in a way. I mean, you, that had a message, too. It's, it's kind of bizarre. I mean, I had to go to the gun range. I had to learn to shoot guns, like, for that. I think it was that movie. And, um, and then... Uh, you know, it's like almost everything I got cast in. At some point, I'd have to pick up a gun. It's very bizarre. But, you know, I like it. So, it's good, you know. There, there's, this, uh, there's this whole women. genre with, it seems to be with beautiful women and guns. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're very sweet. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, I just did um, an interview last week for the director. Um, his name's Tom D. Simone. Is that who you were talking about? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I did. He's uh, there's a uh, journalist in Germany doing a book on him, mm. and uh, we chatted last week about Tom and what the experience was. But again, I mean, between Tom and the executive producer, they were just so caring and you know just so kind with me. And I hadn't done a lead like that um, with a big production company, and. They said, well, we want you, but the head of New World Pictures wants to meet you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, you know. Always when you find out it's the last thing, you've got to jump over the last uh, the last interview. And so I got to New World Pictures. I was telling this, it just remembered all this stuff, to um, New World. And I met them in the lobby, and it's huge. And I walked in, and they go, how are you doing? And, you know, we're here, don't worry about it, and all this stuff. And I go, I'll be right back, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And I just wanted a minute to take some deep breaths. Yeah. But I went in, I hate to say this, I vomited. Oh. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, now I can do this. <laughs> and then I came back out, they took me in this huge conference room, and just uh, the director and producer and the head of New World sat there. And, you know, it was a piece of cake, but it's just, it's just so funny, people... You know, that's why I also like the process, because it's like, yeah, it's not it's not nas- necessarily natural. You know, you kind of got to, you just got to do the work right. and go through, <laughs> you know, the go through it, you know. Well, I know my daughter here has got to ask you about Mark. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, because uh, obviously we loved you in the film, but another actor that was in the film who we love from other projects as well as Mark Blankfield. So what was oh, it like yeah. working with him? I imagine, I mean, at least the way he comes off on screen, he comes off like a hoot. He's hysterical. And, you know, I didn't have that many scenes with him in the film that I remember. Um, but he was great on set. Uh, and he just, there was a scene where... Um, me, he's driving a ice cream truck. We're right. like trying right. to get away or something, and we were just we would try so hard to laugh, not to laugh when the camera was rolling, <laughs> because that was the funniest you know situation to be put in with a comedic actor like that, um, and it was a blast. So that's, you know, probably the first time I learned you can actually have fun, a lot of fun, <laughs> when you're working, and that was with Mark, so. Mm, right. So I wanted to ask you uh, to talk to talk to our audience a little bit. I know that you just launched uh, a new Facebook and Instagram page, but you've been working on mentoring people. Now, what's interesting is not just mentoring as far as acting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, probably, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, um, I, I know someone very close to me that was struggling with some some issues. And, you know, I've always been like a pretty big eating well, you know, advocate. But I decided to dive in deep to that. And um, I got 
nutrition certified to Cornell mm. and um, based on like a 65 year study. So it wasn't just like what's the nearest fat, it's like what scientifically, what's happening to our digestive system, what's happening with our hearts and all that good stuff. And um, it, it's been really great because it's it, a lot of it's so simple. It's just really simplifying things and taking sugar out and processed foods out. And I find, so I've been doing that, you know, kind of on the side for a while now, but mentoring people. But what I'm finding is with um, with COVID, um, a lot more people, like what I feel like what's happening is, you know, there's sort of this global healing happening and we're all aware of our, you know, the things that we need to suddenly were highlighted with either past traumas or mm-hmm. health issues that we need to deal with, the things that we really need to look at for a while. So that's what's coming up. And that's, I'm just working with people saying, you know, I'm not like, I'm not like a doctor or anything, but this is what I've learned and this is the journey I've taken. And it includes everything from nutrition some people acting just basically on their career, some people some spiritual uh, journey work, and it kind of all goes together, really. I mean, it's like, especially as an actor, you know, if your machine, if your vessel's in good shape and you're in good condition and you're spiritually or in your mind, um, it just makes the job so much easier. So not everybody that I work with is an actor, actually just, you know, a few. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I really find a lot of enjoyment in that, helping people a lot. Because of the, the headlines we see in a newspaper all the time, hear about a lot of these uh, very pretty actresses that get taken advantage of. And, and I don't really see that you've ever been in that position. You've always been a very strong person. Isn't that? How do you advise young actresses coming up about not being taken advantage of casting couch or otherwise well you know this sounds really you know you know silly but you know there's always the word no yeah (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know and carry a Um, big gun like like your character would would help too yeah and you know um i mean i'm sure some people like maybe flirted with me a little bit but People were always pretty respectful. Um, so, you know, really for young women is, you know, I think it's important to have good mentors in your life and, mm-hmm. and role models. Uh, because, you know, until you're presented with something like that, you don't really, you're caught in the moment, don't even realize where something's headed, yeah. you know? And it's like, it, that's just so many people with Harvey and all those things, like suddenly they're just, thrown off like what what are you (laughs) you know doing the lead in his film and then he wants them to meet him in his hotel room (laughs) don't meet in a hotel room meet in a restaurant you know just just don't be afraid to say no and I don't mean just no to the guy but like if that's what they want you to do to get the part that's not the right part right and you're not going to feel good about it so um but yeah, I think it's it's really smart to hook in for young women to to hook in with like strong women, you know, in your in your field and identify and you know see what the voice they have. It it helps, you know, especially now with so many um, actresses who have spoken up with Me Too movement and all that. It's like people go like, oh, saying no is an option. Speaking up and saying this happens in public is is an option you know yeah. you don't have to feel like you've done something wrong because i was wondering so. how, how you stood your ground because for instance we talked about new world of which i'm a big fan of new world films but they're really known uh, for a lot of exploitive scenes a lot of nudity and and even with the character that you played you didn't do any of that i mean did you did you have to tell them no or um no it's funny the journalist asked me that too that was never presented um for that but, um, you know, I have to, you know, again, I'm knocking on wood as we speak because um, I know that I've been fortunate, but, like, when I was doing Silk, um, the head guy at that time when I was doing Silk, his name was Brandon Tartikoff. He was 
like a huge developer Absolutely. of projects yeah. in the world. And, and so my agent said, you know, we've got a meeting with Brandon. He wants to talk about developing the project. And I was like, okay. I had no clue. It was before people were really Googling so much yeah. and all that stuff. And um, so we went in, and it was interesting at first. I just have to say something positive about them. But so at first the meeting was kind of very dry and more like an executive. And I was kind of feeling a little squirmy and like, oh no, this is not going to go anywhere. But then suddenly he, he said to me, he goes, well, let me ask you a question. If you could play anything, what would it be? And I just like, without even thinking, I like did my wrist like like Spider-Man <laughs> and, uh -huh. and he goes seriously and I go oh yeah and he goes you mean a female Spider-Man and I was like oh yeah uh. that would be amazing so he got really excited I got really excited suddenly the meeting changed and he goes I have something for you and he went behind his desk and he took out this I still have it this huge black thick um, crew jacket with Spider-Man embroidered on the back. Aww. and I mean, huge. And I just screamed. I got up and grabbed him and kissed him and <laughs> said, thank you. And, and I was so excited. And my agent started trying to take it out of my hands. And I was like, no. And so the whole meeting shifted. And then he brought down the development guy. And we actually had a, a really cool project we were thinking about, unfortunately. Oh, and then at Christmas time that same year, I was on set on Silk, and um, all of a sudden someone brought me a box, and they said, here, this is for you. We came to the studio or whatever, I, I looked at it, it was like from Brandon Tartikoff, and I was like, what? And it was just like a couple months later after that meeting, and he sent me a white, lush robe with Spider-Man embroidered on the back. Wow. I mean, so, I don't know, I had really good experience. And, you know, I had no clue at all, you know, it wasn't preconceived or anything that they were, you know, owned the Marvel characters at that point and everything. I didn't know that when I said that. I was just, you know, just being silly. But, um, but so, yeah, they, they were really nice to me a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And considering how, how popular the Marvel thing is now, that would yeah. have been great. And it maybe could still happen. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I, I must That's say, cool I like to bring up what I think might have been the silliest character. And we know the best characters you played. But would you say the silliest character you ever played was playing the cowgirl in House 2? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was like me just coming out as a baby. And um, I just remember uh, there's this old character actor named Royal Dano. Oh, yes. And... Um, yeah, so they said, you're going to go, you know, it was like a um, Halloween scene where everyone's dressed up in costume, and, and I was like, cowgirl, and he was like all dusty and looked really old and stuff, and he had some prosthetics <laughs> on and his face, and I was like, okay, so they go, you're going to be sitting on his lap, and blah, 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 and I was like, okay, kind of weird, but so I sat down on his lap, and, and um, we rehearsed, and he like whispered in my ear, he goes, let me teach you something. He goes, never let me steal your light. Do you see when you lean in like this? I'm shadowing you. Oh. you never let anyone take your light. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I mean, even from the beginning, I got just great, you know, sort of mentors along the way. And I've never forgotten that, you know, more on a, I would say a spiritual level, yeah. you know, just like, don't ever let anyone take your light, right. you know? I hear all these so, stories from, from actresses like that that work with, like, John Carradine, and if you would have been an Angel One, it would have been Rory, Car Rory Carahoon. And, and, you know, they mm -hmm. have great advice, and, and he's definitely oh, yeah. a trooper, yeah. And well, just the fact that he took the time to teach me something, you know? It was pretty cool. Right. So I wanted to ask you, though, Mitzi, uh, before before we wrap up, first of all, just to let everybody mm -hmm. know, they can check out uh, Mitzi's uh, official Facebook and Instagram pages. If you go on Facebook, just look up Mitzi Capture. Um, and then uh, over on uh, Instagram, you're at uh, Mitzi Capture Official. Um, but in regards to kind of like the mentoring thing that you had talked about, uh, can people reach out to you on one of those platforms if they're interested in maybe, you know, getting advice or a mentoring session? 
in with you? Do you? Are, I assume you're doing it virtually now because of COVID and all that stuff, right? Totally, yeah. And it's actually worked, it works really well. I don't know about everyone else, but you know, I think people are getting really comfortable that they kind of are able to stay in their space and mm-hmm. they don't have to drive through traffic for an hour and all of those things. You know, I think they're more receptive and open. And uh, but yes, I, it's um, actually it's. On Facebook, it's Mitzi Capture Official, and on Instagram, it's Mitzi Capture Official. And uh, I will have a website soon, but it's not it's not up just yet. So Instagram would be the best spot for okay. that. Send a message. Yeah. Okay. Well, the internet seems to be your friend because Silk Stockings has a whole new audience now. Because I don't know if you knew this or not, there is a internet channel, it's a service called uh, uh, Stir. And they have 24 hours of silk stocking. 24-7 silk stocking. 24-7 really? silk stocking, yes. Yeah. It's a channel I called Stir. I was not aware. Yeah. yeah. I was not aware. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I'll have, to, I'll have to bring that up. I actually did have a conversation last week. I, who knows if it'll happen, but for anybody who's really, like, dark, diehard fan, um, I had a conversation um, that it's like almost a 30 year reunion 25th or 30 30th and i you know we still get requests like why don't you guys get back together you know make rob's death was all a dream and all this stuff so um we have talked we're just beginning to talk about it possibly wow that would be incredible be great so i take it you yeah. and, i take it you and rob are really good friends in real life um, we we are, but you know, both of our lives obviously we've gone on and had kids, and yeah. you know, all that stuff. So, but yeah, we we used to have a lot of fun together. I love the first episode when when he was kind of hitting on you, and you made it clear that not while you're working together, but if you guys weren't working together, you would race him to a <laughs> motel room. <laughs> Yeah, you have seen some 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 of those shows. That's great. Um, yeah, you know, Stephen Candle told me that in like the first interview with him. He said, "Now this show is going to push the limit. You know, it's going to push the envelope in every way. But the one thing that will stay the same is your character and Rob's character. We will never hook up. You'll never get together. You're best friends." unless the show is ending or you know you guys are leaving or something and so so we never did and it actually it really opened up a lot more space for a lot a lot of different emotions to be played and being someone's best friend instead of you know it, I think that's also maybe what helped the chemistry yeah. right. because it, that wasn't something we had to worry about or think about and um I think it was brilliant on Stephen's part to set that up right in the beginning, but it was funny because when I, you know, when I got pregnant with my first daughter in real life, um, I started working and I was newly pregnant, and they didn't introduce my pregnancy or anything into the show until I was like, I think it was six and a half months pregnant. I was like carrying big purses and files, <laughs> and different things, you know, and then suddenly. You know, in the last five episodes, uh, we confess our love to each other, that we've always loved each other. Mm-hmm. The next episode, I think, um, we either talked about marriage or found out that I got pregnant and then got married and then and then he died. Yeah. He got shot. Mm-hmm. And then I mourned him leaving. It was it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. And then, yeah. I love the humorous moments, too. You had some great bosses, uh, Ben Vereen and Charlie Brill and, and that. I mean, love them yeah. so much. Yeah. Love both of those guys so much. Ben Vereen is just, talk about spiritual. All he had to do was just look at you. He's got the most intense eyes, and uh, and he played that a lot in his character. You yeah. know, he would do all kinds of things, but... But I really loved that guy, and Charlie and Missy Brill were just, oh my God, they were amazing to work with. It was just, they're some of the funniest people I've met on a set. Um, again, bring in the darkness, bringing playfulness around it, you know, and it helped us, I think, be more yeah. complete human beings as the characters. Right. And you never know who you're going to run into. I, I told everybody in the audience here I was going to, 
uh, and by sharing this story with you, uh, writing for a couple of genre magazines, uh, we cover a lot of horror films and stuff, and I, I wound up on a set come to find out it was a porn, believe it or not. It was a horror film with, with porn uh-huh. in it. And somehow, oh I was so, so bored because once you see it, you've seen it, it's like, okay, well, they're doing it again. It was boring. But I'm talking right. with the camera people, and we were talking about camera techniques and, and shooting beautiful shots. And I was laying out to these camera people how camera people should be more like the beautiful shots they shot in silk stockings. And they stood up, oh, and they're like, wow. they stood up, and they're like, thank you. I'm like, what? We were the camera people on Silk Stockings. <laughs> oh, wow. And here I met him on this obscure porn set, so it was very strange. That's hysterical. Yeah, it, you know, it, um, it was pretty cool. I mean, they um, they did a great job with the cinematography, yes. I, I felt. And, um, you know, in the beginning it was a little crazy, like when they would bring out a yellow suit for me, and I'd go, what? <laughs> and then, like, Rob would wear, like, lime green. They would pick... That's the one thing they wanted to do. It was, kind of the Miami, it was kind of the Miami Vice feel, the way the wardrobe was or something. In you the know? beginning, yeah. yeah. Well, they did that because they um, they wanted two new primary colors per episode. Yeah. So they, they would pick, like, pink and fuchsia and lime green. That was, like, the most radical one, I think. <laughs> but then... Suddenly, like the pencil holder on the desk at work was lime green. Like they popped the colors in different places. It was a little disorienting at first, and then they mellowed that out a little bit. You know, they muted it more. But it was, you know, everybody in it wanted to put their creative input in and try something different. I think that was the beautiful thing about that show. And I think in the second season, it started to sort of really gel because everyone's input sort of gelled into one more one sort of consciousness about what the show was really about and I think I felt like the writing got better our characters got better um, my hair got better <laughs> my, the wardrobe got better <laughs> everything got better I, I liked hearing Ben Vereen complain about how the new uh, headquarters looked like a sci-fi set or something it's just <laughs> sci-fi yeah. yeah well you know it's interesting because that set in the bullpen um, Stu Siegel, that's his studio down in San Diego. Mm-hmm. I went to visit him probably a year ago, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he has uh, Marines training down there now, and it's like, and also SWAT teams come mm-hmm. down there, and they build sets and stuff like villages where there's a war zone and different things so they can go in and train and sort of have some of those experiences before they really go out. And, uh, you know, what they're trying to do is um, to train them, but also to cut back so much on the PTSD Mm -hmm. because they're psychologically a little bit more prepared, which I think is amazing. But in the soundstage is still that one photograph. um, It was, they said it was like maybe supposed to be Stephen Cannell with a, like black, with like a blue cop um, and this, thing that went across it's a mural that was in the bullpen it's right. still in the state wow. the Marine <laughs> Guard, so they left it so that yeah. was pretty cool tell them to keep it there because when you have that big reunion with Rob you know that reunion movie okay they can they can use that because I really yeah. you know as we end us I really you know I'm, I'm I love the fact you're doing what you're doing you know with with behind the camera and and also the mentoring but please don't stop acting we want to see your lovely face on the screen Aww. again Oh, thank you so much. You guys are both lovely. I thank really you. appreciate thank it you. very much. And <laughs> once again, we remind our audience you can check out uh, Mitzi on Facebook and Instagram, Mitzi Capture Official on both. And uh, Mitzi, thank you so much for joining us tonight and spending some time. It's been it's been lovely. It's been super nice. Thanks so much, and stay well.